Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In our last lesson, we began talking about the concept about, of maximum solubility. Maximum solubility is a, a particular amount of a solid that can be dissolved in a liquid, and it may be a very, very small quantity, or it may be also quite a large quantity, up to 100 grams per liter. Also, in last, our last lesson, we saw what occurs when a solid is dissolved in a liquid. And we saw that, as an example, when we put some sodium chloride that is represented in this way in some water that is represented in this way, we see that the water molecule surrounds the water, the, the sodium chloride, and bring into solution the various ions, sodium and chloride, of which it is composed. Well, when we attain the maximum solubility, we see that a situation of dynamic equilibrium is created. Namely, when the maximum solubility is attained, there is uh, some solid that is not dissolved into the liquid. But the process of the solution of the solid into the liquid keeps on going on. But from the liquid, the same amount of solid that dissolves in the unit time precipitates again on the solid. So, uh, some, somebody that observes what is occurring does not realize anything because the same number of moles of solid uh, are dissolved into the liquid and in the unit time the same amount of solid precipitated from the solution into the solid. So it, in, this is another situation of dynamic equilibrium in which the speed of dissolution is equal to the speed of precipitation. The, and also this system are ruled by the Le Chatelier law. Obviously the Le Chatelier law says that when we perturb and then we perform a perturbation on a system that is in dynamic equilibrium, the system in dynamic equilibrium responds so as to make the smallest possible the perturbation of the system. As an example, uh, if we have that a solid is in equilibrium with the, the saturated solution, an increase of temperature increases the amount of solid that dissolves if the delta H of solution, the heat of solution is higher than zero, namely it is an endothermic process. And this is in perfect agreement with the Le Chatelier law, Le Chatelier principle has. When you increase the temperature, you supply heat to the system and the system has to respond with the variation that absorb it. As the dissolution of the solid into the liquid is an endothermic process, the endothermic process is favored by giving heat to the system. This is all the, the same that an increase of heat decreases the amount of solid that is dissolved into the liquid and thus precipitated if the heat of solvatation is lower than zero, namely it is an exothermic process, because an increase of temperature always favors the, the process that absorb heat. If the dissolution creates it, the precipitation absorb it. In this case, the precipitation of the solid is favored by an increase of temperature. Well, from what we have just said, it follows that the solubility variation with the right temperature may result in the precipitation of the solid if the temperature varies, or in the further dissolution of the solid. An other point should be stressed when talking about solution. The various behavior or the various compound that can be dissolved in a liquid namely the electrolytic dissociation. When a solid dissolves, or also when our other sol 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 solute is 
dissolved in a liquid, three different types of behavior may occur. The first one is the molecule of solvent simply surrounds the particle of solute and brings them into solution. The second behavior is molecule of solvent surround the ion composing the solute and bring them into solution as ions. Alternatively, the molecules of solvent completely dissociate the molecule of solute, bringing them in solution as ions. And the third behavior is the molecule of solvent react with the molecules of the solute, giving rise to a partial formation of ions. Let's take an example of each of these three different behaviors. As far as the first behavior is concerned, an example is given by the dissolution of sugar in water. Sugar is a molecular solid that is composed by quite large molecules. It was a, a chemical formula is C6H12O6. And in its dissolution of water, water molecules surround the sugar molecules and bring them into solution. This behavior <coughs> is called our behavior as a non-electrolyte. Namely, in a non-electrolyte behavior of a compound, it means that the molecules of this compound are brought into the solution by the molecules of the solvents and no dissociation occurs of the molecules itself as it occurs with sugar. An example also of case two is the dissolution of sodium chloride in water as we already saw. In this case, the sodium chloride is composed by a solid in which there are sodium ion and chloride ion. Sodium ion and chloride ion are surrounded by water molecules and are brought in solution. This is a very important fact because every mole of sodium chloride which dissolves gives rise to a mole of sodium ion and a mole of chloride ion. Finally, the total concentration present in solution is the double of the one analytically determined. Uh, I hope you will uh, focus your attention on this point, which is very, very important. One mole of sodium chloride, which is brought into solution, gives rise to one mole of sodium ion and one mole of chloride ion. So the total concentration of the species that are in solution is exactly the double of what was analytically determined. This is a very important fact because all the species that are in solution are active in, in, in uh, determining the molar depression of the freezing point, the rise of the boiling point, and the depression of the vapor pressure. So the electrolytic dissociation must be kept into, uh, must be borne in mind when making calculation of colligative properties of solution. This behavior is said behavior as strong electrolyte. To distinguish the behavior of weak of non-electrolyte and strong electrolyte, a parameter that is say the dissociation degree labeled with the, grid, the, the letter alpha of the Greek alphabet, this parameter dissociation degree alpha is defined as the fraction of the number of moles that are dissociated, number of moles of the sol of solute that are dissociated, divided by the number of moles initially present. It is obvious that the non-electrolyte behavior gives rise to an alpha value equal to zero, because if there were one mole of sugar 
and one mole of sugar goes into solution surrounded by water molecules, there will not be any molecule of sugar that is dissociated into ion. Whereas the behavior of strong electrolytes give rise to a value of alpha, a value of the dissociation degree, which is perfectly equal to, you, to the unity, nickel to one. It means that all the moles, all the particles that are brought into solution are brought into solution as dissociated ions. An alternative way of expressing the dissociation degree is in percent unity. So the dissociation degree may vary between 0 and 1 or may vary between 0 and 100. Namely, if we say that the dissociation degree is 0 0.50, we can also say that dissociation degree is the 50%. Then there is another type of electrolyte behavior, as is in the case three. And in this case, we have that <clears throat> the compound that is dissolved into water, reacts with water, thus giving rise to a chemical reaction which does not go to complexion. Namely, if we put some hydrofluoric acid into solution, it dissolves into hydroxonium ion H plus and into fluoride ion F minus. But as soon as hydroxonium ion H plus with, together with fluoride ion F minus goes into solution, they can react with each other, thus giving rise again to hydrofluoric acid undissociated. When the speed of dissociation equals the speed of recomposition of, hydro of hydrofluoric acid, a situation of dynamic equilibrium will be attained. And uh, this other behavior is called a behavior weak electrolyte. And as for non-electrolyte, alpha was equal to zero. As for strong electrolyte, alpha was equal to unity. For weak electrolyte, the dissociation degree alpha is range between zero and unity but cannot be equal both to zero and both to unity, because when it is exactly equal to zero, it is a known electrolyte. When this is equal, exactly equal to unity, it is a strong electrolyte. So whatever value ranging between zero and united, with the exclusion of the extreme of this range, will mean electrolytic behavior as a weak electrolyte. Well, the determination of the total concentration that is present in some solution when a solute behaves as a weak electrolyte demands, requires a small mass balance. Look at this. If M0 is the analytical molality of hydrofluoric acid, namely analytical, what does it mean? It means that if we put 0 0.1 moles of hydrofluoric acid in 1,000 grams of water, the analytical molality of this solution is 0 0.1 molal. Okay. Well, if you put 0 0.1 mole of hydrofluoric acid in 1,000 grams of water, we will have that only a part of the hydrofluoric acid will result dissociating this hydroxonium and fluoride anion. And this amount will be equal to alpha, which multiplies M0. 
And in the same way, the molality of the fluoride ion that does go into solution will be alpha multiplied alpha times M0. It is obvious that these two quantity must be exactly equal, because if you see the stoichiometry of this D reaction, all the, coef the stoichiometric coefficient are 1, 1, 1. So from the dissociation of one mole of hydrofluoric acid, it arises then one mole of hydroxonium ion and one mole of fluoride ion are produced. So if uh, alpha M0 moles of hydroxonium ion are passed into solution, the same amount alpha multiplied M0 must blast into solution together with the hydroxonium ion. Then the concentration hydrofluoric acid that remain undissociated is M0 is the initial concentration before that prior to the dissociation begin. Alpha, more, alpha M0 is the amount of hydrofluoric acid which is dissociated. So the difference between M minus alpha M0 is the amount, is the concentration of hydrofluoric acid which remain undissociated. Putting in evidence M0, it remains M0 which multiplies 1 minus alpha. So, to have the total concentration of all the species that are present in solution, the concentration of the molality uh, of hydroxonium ion must be summed to the concentration of the molality of fluoride ion, must be summed to the molality of the undissociated hydrofluoric acid, and the sum of these three terms will give us the total molality of all the species present in solution that are active toward the rising of the boiling temperature, to the depression of the freezing temperature, to the depression of the vapor pressure. The sum of these three amounts will be alpha M0 plus alpha M0 plus alpha, which multiplies 1 minus M0. Putting in evidence M0, we obtain M0, which multiplies alpha plus alpha plus 1 minus alpha. Namely, the result will be M0, which multiplies 1 plus alpha. Okay? This is quite a simple way of reasoning. Uh, however, uh, many exercises many will be performed will be developed in the exercise reaction. Finally, to complete, to accomplish the chapter of solution, there's, um, um, there is still one topic, the solution of gases in liquid. In the solution of gas into liquid, uh, the gas pressure plays a very important role. Uh, it must be said that when we dissolve a solid into a liquid and a liquid into a liquid, pressure does not play a very important role, as pressure does not have a large effect on the condensated phases, solid and liquid, whereas it plays it has a very large effect on the aeriform fuss. So the amount of a gas that dissolves into a liquid is a function of the pressure or the partial pressure of the gases itself. Then it must also be said that the process of solubility of a gas in a liquid is always an exothermic, is always an exothermic process. Why it is an exothermic process? We saw that the process of dissolution of a solute in a solvent 
it is composed of three steps. The first step is the disgregation of the, uh, of the structure of uh, the solute, but this uh, amount of energy in the case of a gas will be practically zero because in a gaseous system the interaction between among the various molecules will be very very weak so weak that the disgregation of the structure of a gas will not uh, does not need any energy so delta h1 is practically zero then the delta h2 which concerned the fact that the molecules of solvent must become far from each other to create the space for the solute molecule to be located therein. Also, this amount of energy, delta H2, is be, can be neglected. Why? Because we saw that always the amount of a gas that dissolves in a liquid is quite small. So the various molecules of water must become farther from each other of a very small amount. So also this odor delta H2 can be neglected. Finally, the delta H3, namely the energy which is uh, released by the system uh, by, <clears throat> by the system toward the external the outer environment will be small but will not be neglectable at all so delta h1 is zero delta h2 is zero delta h3 is small but it's always negative it means that the dissolution of a gas in a liquid will always be an exothermic process. This is the reason why when a, uh, a liquid that has a gas dissolved therein is heated, the solubility of the gas in the liquid becomes lower and some gas is um, released by the liquid toward the external environment okay this is the reason why when we put some water in a pot and we uh, heat this water firstly the uh, solubility of air in to the water becomes lower and some bubble of air inside the water is formed. And then as, as soon as temperature is increased, these bubble of air are saturated with vapor pressure and only when the vapor pressure of uh, water vapor inside the bubble becomes equal to the pressure that is over the free surface of the liquid, the bubble can form, can grow, can go up, can explode and may release into the air all the water vapor that was contained therein. Coming back to the, the law that is followed by when a gas is dissolved in a liquid, the, when a gas is dissolved in a liquid, it follows the Henry's law, which says P1 is equal to H, which multiplies X1, where P1 is the partial pressure of the gas 1, X1 is the mole fraction in the liquid phase of gas 1, and the H is the Henry constant, which increases with increasing temperature, namely with increasing temperature, being these products always a constant because increasing the temperature, the pressure of the gas remains the same, it will mean that the X1, namely the mole fraction present in the liquid phase of the gas 1, become lower, and it means that solubility of a gas into a liquid decreases with 
increasing temperature. It is found that the maximum solubility of non-polar gases such as oxygen and nitrogen, which are the main component of air, I remind you that the atmosphere where we live is composed by 78% volume of nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, and then there is an amount of water vapor varying between 1 and 5%. We have that the amount of the, the maximum solubility of oxygen or nitrogen in water is quite a low value. The reason is that molecules of oxygen and nitrogen are completely apolar molecules, whereas water is a strongly polar solvent. In chemistry, and I say also in life, this principle holds. The principle is the similar, the solvent is similar. It means that if water is a very polar solvent, it will dissolve very well very polar substances or also ionic substances. So water dissolves very well ethyl alcohol, which is quite a polar substance. This solves very well sodium chloride, which is anionic substances, but it solves very badly gasoline because it is composed by apolar molecules and also dissolves quite in a scarce way to a scarce extent apolar molecules such as oxygen and such as nitrogen. It must be said that Another apolar molecule, says carbon dioxide, is dissolved in much larger, in, in a highly larger extent than oxygen or nitrogen. But this difference can be explained quite easily. Actually, carbon dioxide reacts with water with an equilibrium reaction which does not go to complexion, thus giving rise to the hydrogen carbonate ion and the hydroxonium ion. So the higher solubility of carbon dioxide, which is a completely apolar molecule, such as oxygen and such as nitrogen, may be explained by the fact that carbon dioxide reacts with water, whereas oxygen and nitrogen do not react with water. Namely, the dissolution of oxygen and nitrogen in water is merely a physical process. Namely, when the molecules of nitrogen or oxygen are dissolved in water, they are surrounded by molecules of water and nothing else occurs, whereas when the dissolution of carbon dioxide into water occurs, molecules surround the molecule of molecules of water surround the molecule of hydrogen of carbon dioxide, and molecules of water reacts with carbon dioxide, thus giving rise to hydrogen carbonate ion and hydroxonium ion. Then these two ions may reassociate to give back carbon dioxide and water. But we can say that the higher extent to which carbon dioxide dissolves in water rather than oxygen or nitrogen may be ascribed mainly to the fact that the dissolution of carbon dioxide into water is a chemical process involving the chemical reaction which is reported here. Whereas the solution of oxygen and nitrogen into water is merely a physical process. 
in which molecules of water surround the molecule of solid. Okay? <clears throat> Now, let's begin another chapter of this course. The chapter that we are going to begin now is the chemical kinetics. This chapter study the speed of chemical reaction. This is a very important chapter of chemistry because kinetics tell us what in reality occurs and in reality it does not occur. Well, very fast reactions such as acid base are recorded. So they, they, these reactions are so fast that only very small fraction of seconds are necessary to be completed. Usually in acid base reaction, the rate determining step is the mixing of the two of the, of the two solutions, the acid and the basic. Also, there are very, very slow reactions, such as the hardening of cement and the geologic process. What does hardening of cement mean? Cement is sold under the form of a very, very fine powder. This very, very fine powder must be mixed with water and the water reacts with this powder of cement. Well, the reaction of water with the powder of cement, in theory, needs an infinite time. It is said that <clears throat> in one year, about the 97, 98% of what can react has reacted. But in the reality, the remaining 1% to 3% that does not react, it takes about an infinite time to go to complexion. Well, let us define the rate of a reaction first of all. Let's take a very simple reaction, a compound A that turns into a compound B. Namely, it can be the reaction in which an isomer of a compound turns into another isomer. If we view it a diagram in which on the abscissa axis is, is reported time and second, and the, on the ordinate axis is reported the concentration of the reactant A and of the concentration of the product of reaction B, if the stoichiometry of the reaction is that one, namely, all the stoichiometric coefficients are 1, 1, 1, we have that concentration of A starts from at time 0 from the value A0, which is the initial concentration of the chemical species A, and then it exponentially decreases in this way, and it will become zero only at infinite time. Contemporaneously, the concentration of the product of reaction B with at time zero is perfectly equal to zero. It begins to grow, to grow, to grow, to grow, and it asymptotically tends to the value of concentration of A0, which becomes the concentration equal B at infinite time. So, this car reports the concentration of the A component as a function of time, and this other car reports the concentration of the B product of reaction as a function of time. You must remember that when you have a symbol of a compound between square bracket, this way of writing means that this is the concentration of these species expressed in mole per liter. So it can be a reaction that occurs in gaseous phase or also a reaction that occurs in a liquid solution. Let us take two values of time. 
T1 and T2. The average velocity of this reaction in the time T1, T2 is, 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 is written with R. And the bar over the R denotes the fact that this is a average speed of reaction in the lag of time T2 minus T1. It will be the concentration A2, concentration at the time T2, minus the concentration A1, namely the concentration of A at time 1, with the sign minus because the concentration A2 is lower than the concentration A1. Or in the same way, the rate of reaction can be the, the average rate of reaction in the lag of time T1, T2 minus T1 will be the difference of the concentration of B at time 2 minus the concentration of B at time 1. <coughs> But this is an average speed. If we want the speed of reaction in a particular point, as an example, the point T1, we must follow the reason that I'm going, the reasoning that I'm going to tell you now. We will take this lag of time T1, T2. And we lag, we half, we half this lag of time. By halving this lag of time, we will have a, always an average velocity. But it will be an average velocity in a lag of time which is smaller. So it will be a value of velocity which will be closer to the velocity that the reaction displays at the time T1. After having halved one time this lag of time, we halve a second time, so it could become a quarter. We will always have a speed, a velocity of the reaction, a speed of the reaction which is an average value, but the lag of time will be even smaller, will be a quarter of the initial lag of time. So the value of the average velocity will be closer to the value of velocity that will have the reaction at time t1. So by halving an infinite number of time, this lag of time, we will have a lag of time that will be small as you like. Namely, you will have that the lag of time t2 minus t1, namely delta t, it will become, instead of a finite quantity, will be an infinitesimal quantity. Contemporaneously, also delta b or delta a will become infinitesimal quantity. But the ratio between these two infinitesimal quantity will be a finite a finite quantity, and it will be the velocity of the reaction at the time T1. This is the mathematical process of limit. So we can say that the velocity, the speed of the reaction in a time, in a particular, at a particular time, is given by this formula, namely the rate of reaction will be equal to the limit for delta t tending to zero of minus delta a divided by delta t, which is the same to say limit for delta t tending to zero of delta b divided by delta t. Okay? <coughs> Well, <clears throat> the rate of an homogeneous reaction depends on the following parameter. Homogeneous reaction means that the reaction, the reagent, and the product of reaction are all in the same phase. 
namely all the compounds are in the gaseous phase, all the compounds are in the solution, and so on. In this case, the speed or the, the, the rate of reaction depends on the nature of the reagents, the concentration of the reagents, the absolute temperature, and the presence of a catalyst. Uh, before going into detail, I will tell you the fact that if a reaction is heterogeneous, heterogeneous means that at least one reagent or product of reaction is in the solid state, the rate of reaction depends also on the specific surface per mass unit of the solid reaction. Let's see this point. <clears throat> You have a reactant that is in the form of a cube, a solid cube, which has a side of one centimeter. The total surface that this cube exposed to the reaction, it will be one face area is one square centimeter. One per one is one square centimeter is this cube has six faces, so six faces per one square centimeter, it will be six square centimeter. The reaction will occur only on this surface that is exposed to the other reactants that are in the gaseous state or that they are in the solution state. So the reaction, the rate of the heterogeneous reaction will be strongly affected by this value of the surface. If we uh, share this cube of one centimeter of side in 100 cubes, excuse me, in 1,000 cubes with one millimeter of side, we have Look at this, along this side, we have one centimeter become 10 millimeter. Along this side, it becomes older one centimeter, 10 millimeter. Along this side, we have that one centimeter become 10 millimeter. 10 per 10 per 10 equal 1,000 cubic millimeter. So we will have 1,000 cubic millimeter, and every one of this cube of one millimeter for side has a surface that every cube has the surface of one millimeter. There are six faces, there are 1,000 cubes, so the total surface will be 6,000 square millimeter, and 6,000 square millimeter will be equal to 60 square centimeter. When the cube was integral, was of one centimeter of side, the surface that would have was exposed to the other reactant was only six centimeter square centimeter. When the cube has been shared into 1,000 cube or one millimeter of side, the surface that is exposed to the other reactant will be 60 square centimeter. It means that in this second case, the rate of reaction will be 10 times higher than in the first time. Because when we have an heterogeneous reaction, the, uh, the rate of reaction is exactly proportional to the area that is of a solid that is exposed to the other reactant which, which are in the fluid state, in the fluid phase namely gas or solution. So we'll solve this five point saying that when we have an heterogeneous reaction, 
the heterogeneous reaction rate will be strongly affected by the specific surface. And we can practically say that the speed of reaction grows linearly with the specific surface of the solid. <clears throat> then, let's see the other points. Let's see how the speed of a reaction is affected by the nature of the reactants. Let's take a couple of examples. In the first case, we have a an, an redox reaction between permanganate ion MnO4 minus 1, which reacts with the with, uh, uh, five ferrous Fa plus 2 ions in uh, acidic environment, namely with 8H plus, thus giving rise to manganese ion Mn2, to five, uh, by five ferric ion Fa plus 3, plus five molecules of water. This reaction is practically instantaneous. We can see that this is an instantaneous reaction because permanganate ion MnO4 gives a strong violet color to the solution. And uh, the fact that this violet color disappear instantaneously tell us that the time in which this reaction goes to completion are extremely short. Then let's take the same strong oxidant permanganate ion. If we want to oxidize oxalic acid, which has formula H2C2O4 in acidic environment, namely the acidic, acidic environment used before, we have that permanganate ion turns into manganese ion. Um, Oxalic haze it turns into carbon dioxide, and then water is formed. We see that also using the same oxidant, also using the same acidic environment, only by changing the reductant, we see that this reaction is very slow. And we can realize that the reaction is very slow by considering the fact that the violet color, which is uh, related to the presence of permanganate ion, will disappear very, very slow. It tells us that the speed of reaction is strongly, strongly affected by the nature of the reagent. Obviously, we let this reaction occur with the same concentration of the reactant, with the same temperature, and in presence of no catalyst. Then, let's see how the speed of our reaction is affected by the concentration of reactant. Let us write the generic reaction. A molecules of the compound A in gaseous phase react with B molecules of the compound B always in the gaseous state, thus giving rise to C molecules of the compound C in gaseous phase and D molecules of the gaseous compound D in gaseous state. We have that the rate of the reaction are, is a function of the concentration of A and B according to this law, R equal to concentration of A elevated to the exponent M and concentration of B elevated to the exponent N. In general, be very careful to this point, the stoichiometric coefficient A 
and the order of reaction because this number m and m are called the order, the kinetic order of the reaction. Namely, the stoichiometric coefficient a does not coincide with the with the kinetic order of reactant A, as well as the stoichiometric component B will not coincide with the kinetic order and of the compound B. There will be only one case in which occurs, and we will see this fact in a few minutes. As an example, we have that for the reaction of gaseous hydrogen, which reacts to with gaseous iodine to give us two molecules of hydroiodic acid, the dependence of, of speed of reaction on the concentration of reaction is the following. R equal to K, which is a constant, that multiplies the concentration of hydrogen elevated at the first power and the concentration of iodine elevated to the first power. In this case, we have that the stoichiometric coefficient of hydrogen, one, will coincide, coincide with the kinetic order of hydrogen, which is one. And also the stoichiometric coefficient of iodine, which is one, will coincide with the, with the, the kinetic order of iodine, which is one, okay? So for this reaction, we have that stoichiometric coefficient and kinetic order do coincide, but Let's see this other reaction. We have two molecules of hydrogen in gaseous space, which react with two molecules of nitrogen oxide in gaseous space to give two molecules of water in gaseous space and one mole of nitrogen in gaseous space. We have that the rate of reaction, the dependence of the rate of reaction on the concentration of the reactant is the following, namely R equal to K multiplied by the concentration of hydrogen elevated at the first power and the concentration of nitrogen oxide elevated at the second power. Well, the stoichiometric coefficient of hydrogen is 2 and this kinetic order is 1. So for hydrogen, the stoichiometric coefficient and kinetic order do not coincide. It coincides for nitrogen oxide, but on the wall we can say that for this reaction stoichiometric coefficient do not coincide with the kinetic order. In a few minutes we'll, we study a theory which explain all these facts. Then let's see how the speed of a reaction depends on temperature. <clears throat> well, the speed of a reaction is strongly affected by temperature. In particular, it is found that uh, the speed of a reaction increases exponentially with the absolute temperature. The dependence of the speed of reaction on the temperature is hidden into this constant k, which is called the kinetic constant. Actually, the kinetic constant is a function only of the absolute temperature according to this law. The kinetic constant k is equal to the product of another constant a, which is called frequency factor, which multiplies a 
elevated at minus E A, which is the uh, activation energy of the reaction, R is the universal constant of ideal gas, and T is the absolute temperature. If we report on a diagram the value of the kinetic constant K is a function of the absolute temperature T, we have a function like this. We have an exponential growth of this amount that it exponentially tends to this value A. Okay? Because we have that <coughs> when temperature tends to infinite, this exponent tends to zero and E elevated zero tends to one, so the value of the kinetic constant tends to the value of the frequency factor. Then, let's say what presence of catalysts mean. A catalyst is a chemical entity that we found unaltered at the end of the reaction. So it's something that you put in the reactant system and that in the end of the reaction you find it unaltered. However, its presence makes sure that the reaction goes more fast. Namely, if uh, the presence of this catalyst has allowed the reaction to go faster, it may take part to the reaction in some way. Let's make an example. Well, uh, hydrocarbons are molecules that are composed by carbon and hydrogen, and are molecules that go for a very low number of carbon atom up to very, very large molecule or something of like 50, 60 atoms of carbon. This hydrocarbon composed by such a large number of carbon cannot be practically used because they are found at the solid states, are woxy solid in the solid states, and so they do not undergo any reaction and also the only reaction that hydrocarbon, that saturated hydrocarbon perform very easily, the combustion reaction, does not occur easily because of the difficulty of putting into contact the hydrocarbon itself with the oxygen or water. So, it is known that this molecule can be cracked into smaller molecules by by uh, heating hydrocarbon to quite high temperature. As an example, thermal cracking occurs at about 700 degrees with the, the, produ the production of smaller molecules of hydrocarbon and uh, the production of powder of carbon that can be more easily burned and so that they can be used. Well, this reaction is called thermal cracking, but thermal cracking was not industrially employed because at 700 degrees, the amount of high number, high carbon number hydrocarbon that broke into smaller molecules was very small. So the yield of this process was quite low it, it was not feasible from an economic point of view. Cracking reaction has become an economically feasible and very convenient when the cracking reaction was performed in the presence of catalyst that allowed the reaction to occur at a lower temperature, such as 400 degrees, with a 
far higher yield. The catalyst is the zeolite Y in its hydrogen ionic form. Well, these zeolites exhibit a lot of uh, active site in which there are electronic hole, namely uh, hydrogen atom that is bound to the network of SeO2 atom of the zeolite Y does not have any electron, so it has electron hole. So these active sites are very eager of electron, and they take this electron from the sigma bond existing between the various carbon atoms of the molecules of hydrocarbon. So these carbon-carbon bond are strongly made weaker by this attraction of the electron hole of the zeolite HY. And so this reaction occur far more easily. Far more easily means to a very large extent, namely with an higher yield, and a far lower temperature, 400 degree instead of 700 degree. You know, the catalyst zeolite HY was discovered at the end of the 60 year of the past century and it has completely upset the world of the petrochemical industry because before its discovery a lot of hydrocarbon were discarded because it was uneconomical to use them after the discovery of this zeolite HY, the use of this very large amount of hydrocarbon arising from topping operation of oil has become economical. So it can tell you how important are the use of catalysts. Well, at the end of the reaction, the zeolite HY was found unaltered, but it has taken part a very, and it played a very important role in the reaction of the, crat, uh, the catalytic cracking of hydrocarbon because it occurred to an higher yield at a far lower reaction. Well, there is a theory, the collision theory, which explains all the experimental evidences that we have been described until now. The collision theory says that two molecules to react with each other must strike into each other. When a molecule strikes into another molecule, it is not say that this uh, strike is effective. This strike may be effective or this strike may be non-effective. When these two, these two molecules, as a, let's make an example. We can take the reaction between the hydrogen molecule which strikes into a iodine molecule, and it gives rise to two molecule hydroiodic acid. So the reaction and the uh, effective strike or non-effective strike are depicted in this drawing. Here we have a molecule of hydrogen which is depicted here in red smaller and a molecule of iodine, which is depicted here in black, they struck into each other. When striking into each other, an uh, activated complex is formed. In this activated complex, it occurs that the bond existing between the hydrogen atom and the bond existing between the iodine atom are weakened. 
so that these bonds are drawn with dotted line. Contemporaneously, we have that bond between one hydrogen atom and one iodine atom, and one hydrogen atom with one iodine atom begins to form. So the fact is, is depicted by drawing this beginning of bond existing between hydrogen iodine, hydrogen iodine, is depicted with dotted line. Well, when uh, this mo these two molecules strike into each other, we have that if they strike with high, with a low, the low kinetic energy, the energy of these two molecules, the kinetic energy when these two molecules strike into each other, transform into potential energy. But this potential energy, if the kinetic energy of the two molecules that react to each other is not very high, this potential energy arising from the transformation of the kinetic energy into potential energy will not sufficient to attain the energy of the activated complex. So in this case, the two molecules will bounce the one to the other and they will rebound far from each other completely unaltered. You know, this is the situation in which the strike is not effective. And the two molecules get farther from each other. They bounce over each other without resulting an alter. But if the strike between these two molecules, hydrogen and iodine, of course, between two molecules that are moved by a high velocity, so they have a high kinetic energy, when this very fast molecule strikes into each other, the kinetic energy will be totally transformed into potential energy, and this very high value of the potential energy will get over the energy of the activated complex. And so in this case, the strike is, is effective. And when this strike with a lot of energy occurs, the bond existing between the two hydrogen atom and the bond existing between the two iodine atom will be broken completely and completely will be formed the bond between hydrogen atom and iodine atom, and the other hydrogen atom, the other iodine atom, thus giving rise to molecules of hydroiodic molecules. So, the difference between these two cases, which one is? Difference is that in both cases, the two molecules strikes into each other. But in the first case, in the, in the case of not effective strike, we have that we have that the kinetic energy of these two molecules is not sufficient to break completely the bond existing between the two hydrogen atom and two iodine atom. So the two molecules bounce over each other and alter it and the strike is not effective. Whereas, when two molecules moved by a very high speed, so bearing with themselves a very high value of the kinetic energy, when they struck into each other, this very high value of the kinetic energy is transformed into potential energy, the value of the potential energy is higher than the energy of the activated complex. So the energy is sufficient to break completely the bond between the existing between the two hydrogen atom and the two iodine atom. These two bonds are broken completely. And the bond can be created by one hydrogen atom and 
one you die in Napoli, one hydrogen atom, the other one you die in Napoli, which brings to the formation of two molecules of hydroiodic acid. And so in this case, the strike is effective, okay? This situation may be better described in this diagram. Look, this diagram over the abscess axis, you report the distance be, per, uh, that uh, cover the molecules that react and the molecule that are reacted. And over the ordinate axis, you report the potential energy of the system. Look, here in this situation is reported the energy of hydrogen and iodine when they are found from each other. When they break into each other, when they strike into each other, the energy of the system goes up, 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 until this value. The maximum of this curve represents the energy of the activated complex. And then the curve begins to get down, to go down the value. The energy of the system diminishes, 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 until attaining the value of two molecules have hydroiodic acid. Okay? So, the difference between the energy of hydrogen and iodine and two hydroiodic compound is the delta H of the reaction. The, the difference between the, the energy of hydrogen and iodine and the energy of the activated complex is the activation energy of the reaction. Okay? So, when two molecules of one of hydrogen and one of iodine strikes into each other, if the kinetic energy of the molecules is not big, this kinetic energy will turn into potential energy and the energetic barrier of the activation energy is cleaned. The energy goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up, but the two molecules that are striking into each other have not so much kinetic energy, so attain it to this point, there is no energy sufficient to attain the top of this curve. So, if you do not attain the top of this curve, you come back, you come back, you come back, you come back, and the two molecules bounce over the each other and then remain unaltered. And the energy of the system is given back to the system under the form of kinetic energy of hydrogen and iodine. But if two molecules that are moved by a very high speed, and so they have a very high kinetic energy of hydrogen and iodide striking to each other. When they strike into each other, this energy, this kinetic energy is transformed into potential energy. If the potential energy arising from the transformation of kinetic energy to potential energy is sufficiently high so as to attain the top of this curve, namely to attain the value of the activated complex, then the system will be able to go ahead, to go over this maximum point, and the system will go in this way, the bond existing between the two hydrogen atom and the two iodine atom will be broken completely and the bond between the hydrogen atom and the iodine atom, the hydrogen atom and the iodine atom will be formed completely and so the 
activated complex will break into one molecule of hydroiodic acid and another molecule of hydroiodic acid. Okay? Well, the effect of the catalyst can be very easily seen over this diagram. If this is the curve which denotes the potential energy of the reaction as a function of the distance that is covered by the molecules that are reacted, in the absence of catalyst is the blue curve, the red curve is the, the curve that denotes the potential energy of the reaction, developed in the reaction, in the presence of catalyst. Well, the presence of catalyst gives rise to a reduction of the activation energy, namely the energetic barrier that you have to climb in the absence of catalyst is this one, the blue segment. In the presence of the catalyst is this one, the red segment. Obviously, being lower the activation energy needed for the process for the reaction to occur, a far higher fraction of hydrogen ion diodine molecule will have kinetic energy sufficient to undergo the reaction and to give rise after a strike of a molecules of hydrogen and a molecules of iodine to give rise to two molecules of hydroiodic acid. Okay? Well, this diagram is concerned about the direct reaction, namely the reaction which brings from hydrogen and iodine as reactant to two molecules of hydroiotic acid as product of reaction. This other diagram is concerned about the reverse reaction, namely the reaction which brings from two molecules of hydroiotic acid to one molecule of hydrogen and one molecule of iodine. Actually, also for the reverse reaction, an activation energy may be defined, both in the presence or in the absence of a catalyst. As an example, this blue segment is the difference of energy between two molecules of hydroiodic acid and the activated complex in the absence of a catalyst. Also, we have that this red segment will be the difference of energy, of potential energy between two molecules of so hydroiodic acid and the activated complex. You know, you can see that the catalyst lower presence of catalyst result into reduction, into the reduction, reducing the activation energy, both of the direct reaction and the reverse reaction. Obviously, if the reaction that brings from hydrogen and iodine to two molecules of hydroiodic acid exhibit a delta H which is negative, namely this process is exothermic, namely it releases it, the system, to the external environment, to the outer environment, we have that the reverse reaction going from two molecules of hydroiodic acid to a molecule of hydrogen and a molecule of iodine obviously will be an endothermic reaction which absorb it from the outer environment.
Well, I hope you will remember that the average kinetic energy of the molecules is given by the expression, the relation, the average kinetic energy, EC, is equal to the product one half that multiplies the molecular weight of the gas that multiplies by the square of the average speed of the various molecules. And this amount is proportional to the absolute temperature. According to the law, average EC is equal to 3 divided by 1, 3 half, multiplied by R divided by N, which still multiplies the absolute temperature T, where R is the universal, the constant, the universal constant of perfect gases or ideal gases. N is the Avogadro number. And this, uh, this uh, law tells us that the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of a system of n real molecules, gaseous molecules, is a linear function of the absolute temperature. But it is not important which is the average velocity of the molecule. It is important which is the velocity, the speed of each molecule. Because to undergo the reaction, the molecules that strike into each other must exhibit a kinetic energy that when is transformed into potential energy must be higher than the one of the activated complex. So let us re report in this diagram the curve of the speed distribution of various molecules for gases, namely the curve of Maxwell Boltzmann, reported the two different temperatures at a temperature T1 lower than a temperature T2. We have that if the activation energy is the energy needed for the molecule to undergo the reaction and to give rise to an effective strike which, which turn a molecule of hydrogen and a molecule of iodine that strikes into each other into two molecules of hydroiodic acid, we have that the area which is beneath this curve of distribution of uh, molecular speed for values higher than this activation energy, this area tells us which are the fraction of molecule which exhibit a value of the speed and so of the kinetic energy, which is higher than these fixed values, which is the activation energy. We have that these fractional molecules grows exponentially with temperature according to the Boltzmann, the factor Boltzmann, that we already saw when we studied the curve of distribution of the molecular speed in gas. And we see that n divided by n0, namely the fraction of molecule of the n0 molecule of gas present into the system, which exhibit a kinetic energy that is higher than the value activation energy, is equal to this value E elevated at minus activation energy divided by R. The fact that in Arrhenius law, namely the law which bring the dependence, which say us, tell us the dependence of the kinetic constant K is a function of the absolute temperature T. It appears a factor that is equal to the Boltzmann factor tell us that 
that the reason why the defense is this one is that only the molecule which checks with kinetic energy that is higher than the one of the activated energy are able to give rise to an ineffective strike and to give rise a reaction. All the other molecules do not give rise to reaction. So, this collision theory is able to explain us perfectly why a catalyst is able to largely increase the speed of reaction of a particular reaction. And the reason is that the catalyst reducts the activation energy. And so reducing the activation energy, the fraction of molecule which exhibit an active uh, reaction, um, kinetic energy which is higher than the one of the fixed values will be far higher. Then the collision, the collision theory is able also to explain us the dependence of the speed of reaction on the absolute temperature. We saw that this dependence is an exponential dependence. And uh, the proof that this theory works well is that the same Boltzmann factor that appears in the Boltzmann law, it appears also in the Arrhenius law. Those standing out with no doubt that the only the molecules which exhibit a kinetic energy higher than the activation energy of the reaction may undergo the reaction itself. As an example, if this is the value of the activation energy without the presence of a catalyst, if we use the catalyst as an example, this activation energy will become lower, namely this one. It is obvious that both at the temperature T1 and the temperature T2, if we have a lower activation energy, at both temperatures the fraction of molecules exhibiting a kinetic energy which is higher than the reduced activation energy in the presence of the catalyst will be able to undergo the reaction itself. So we can see the action of a catalyst over the speed of a reaction also in this diagram of in where we report the distribution of the molecular velocity of gases. Finally, the frequency factor A, which gives us the frequency of collision between the molecules that can, that may undergo the chemical reaction, increases with the concentration of the reaction. It is obvious that if the concentration has a particular value, as an example one, we will have a particular frequency of collision. If this concentration double, it is obvious that the frequency of collision will be higher. This explaining us why the, why the speed of reaction increases with increasing the concentration of the reagents.
a last point must be studied before ending this chapter of chemistry regarding chemical kinetics. I told you that in some case we have that the stoichiometric coefficient of the reaction coincide with the kinetic order of the reaction as if it took course in the reaction of hydrogen and iodine, which gives two molecules hydroiodic acid. But there are also the reactions such as this one between two molecules of hydrogen which reacts to, with two molecules of nitrogen oxide to give one molecule of nitrogen and two molecules of water in which the stoichiometric coefficient of hydrogen and oxide of nitrogen, which are respectively 2 and 2, do not coincide with the kinetic order of the reaction, which are respectively 1 and 2. How the, the theory of collision, does the theory of collision can the theory of collision explain why, in some case, stoichiometric coefficient and kinetic order coincide, and in some other case, stoichiometric coefficient and kinetic order do not coincide? The answer is yes. The theory of collision is able to explain why, in some case, the, the stoichiometric coefficient coincide with the kinetic order, and in some other case, the stoichiometric coefficient do not coincide with the kinetic order. Look at this. In the case of the reaction of hydrogen with iodine, the reaction goes to complexion in just one stage. Namely, we have that a hydrogen molecule strikes into a iodine molecule, and if the strike occurs with the values of the kinetic energy, which is too low, the kinetic energy transforms into potential energy. The potential energy is not sufficient to climb the energetic barrier of the reaction, and the strike is not effective, and the reaction does not occur. Whereas, if the strike of the hydrogen molecule into iodine molecules occur with a high kinetic energy, the value of the potential energy that we be obtained by transforming the kinetic energy into potential energy will be sufficiently high to get over the energetic barrier of the, com of, of the activated complex, and the reaction will occur and the strike will be effective. So, if the reaction occurs in a single step, we have that stoichiometric coefficient coincide with the kinetic order, and it occurs in the reaction occurring between hydrogen and iodine. Okay? If this does not occur, namely, the reaction is not fulfilled in one single step, well, the situation becomes different, and the kinetic order do not coincide with the stoichiometric efficient. 
as an example, as an example, look at this. We have the reaction that two molecules of hydrogen reacts with two molecules of nitrogen oxide to give one molecule of nitrogen, always gaseous, and two molecules of water. Well, if this reaction had occurred in a single step, it would mean that contemporaneously two molecules of hydrogen must strike contemporaneously with two molecules of nitrogen oxide. And this is, is a very unlikely phenomenon to occur. It means that four molecules, they strike all together. It is not possible to occur. So it means that this reaction does not occur in a single step. Actually, we have that the expression that gives us the rate dependence on concentration tells us that R as uh, uh, rate of the reaction is equal to the pulse of K, which is the kinetic constant, times the hydrogen concentration elevated at the first power and times the nitrogen concentration elevated at the, the second power. We have that in this expression, in this kinetic expression, the kinetic order of hydrogen one does not coincide with the stoichiometric coefficient of nitrogen, of hydrogen, which is two. How can it be explained, this fact? This fact can be explained by considering that to occur in a single step this reaction, it would mean that four molecules, two of hydrogen and two of nitrogen oxide, should strike, in, should strike into each other contemporaneously which is very, very unlikely that a strike involving contemporaneously four different molecules occurs. Well, when something like this occurs, namely that the order of reaction do not coincide with the coefficient, the stoichiometric coefficient, it means that the reaction is not a simple reaction that occurs in a single step, but the, the reaction that we write is the sum of some reaction occurring in series, the one after the others, after the others. In particular, in the case of this reaction, we have that the reaction that in the reality occurs is the reaction between two molecules of nitrogen oxide that strikes into each other to give this compound N2O2, which is very reactive. This, this reaction is very fast. Then this, rea this compound, this intermediate of reaction N2O2, strikes into a molecule of hydrogen. This reaction will bring to the formation of a molecule of N2O, which is another intermediate of reaction, and this is, in this case, a dinitrogen oxide into a molecule of water. And this step of reaction will be slow. Then, Dinitrogen oxide, a molecule of dinitrogen oxide, strikes into an hydrogen molecule to give us a molecule of nitrogen and a molecule of water. And these other steps, the step three is fast. If we sum member to member these three reactions, we will have the reaction that we have written over there. 
which is the complexive reaction that occurs in the system. As an example, 2NO, 2NO, N2O2, N2O2, H2, H2, N2O, N2O is one, H2, H2. Then on the other side of the atom, N2O2, N2O2, N2O, N2O, H2O, H2O, N2, N2, H2O. Now, let's eliminate from this expression all the compound that appears in the same way on the left and on the right of the atom. N2O2 is eliminated with N2O2. N2O is eliminated with N2O. And what it remains? 2NO. 2NO. H2H2. So 2H2. 2H2. Then we have H2O, H2O. Among the product of reaction, we have 2H2O. Then we have N2, N2. So, by summing these three steps of the reaction, we obtain the comprehensive reaction that occurs in the system. When uh, something like this occurs, it is said that the reaction does not occur through a single step, but that it follows a mechanism of reaction. When we have a mechanism of reaction, listen to me very carefully in this point, we can say that the kinetic of the wall process will be the same kinetic of the slowest step of reaction. Namely, we have that this reaction is fast. One. Step one is fast. Step two is slow. Step three is fast. The kinetic of the wall process will be the kinetic of the slowest step, namely this one. Now I'm going to show you an example that will convince you with no doubt of this fact. Look at this. For example, you have a washing basin, okay? This washing basin is filled in with water, and this washing basin has a hole which is able to discharge water at the rate of 10 liters per second. And it discharges water in another washing basin also filled with water, which has a smaller hole, and this smaller hole is able to discharge only two liters per second of water. This second washing basin discharges water into a third washing basin, also filled with water, which has an intermediate hole between the hole of the washing basin one and the washing basin two, and this intermediate hole is able to discharge water at the rate of five liters per second. So, when uh, this process begins, at the beginning, when a stationary state has not attained it at all, we have that these washing basin discharge water at the rate of 10 liters per second. These uh, washing basin will discharge water at the rate of 2 liters per second. And this washing basin will uh, discharge water at the rate of 5 liters per second. But this washing basin discharge 5 liters per second and receive from this washing basin only two liters per second, 
which means that this washing basin, a little by time, will become empty. And when it becomes empty, it will be able to discharge from this washing basin only the two liter per second that it receive from the second washing basin. Okay? So it doesn't matter that this basin discharge 10 liter per second. Doesn't matter that this third basin is, could release, could discharge 5 liter per second of water. When this washing basin has completely become empty, it will be able to discharge away only the 2 liter per second that are discharged by this second basin. This is to say that if the first stage of the reaction is very fast and produces a very high amount of product of reaction, that is denoted by this rate, 10 liter per second. But the second step of the reaction is very slow and produces a very small amount of product of reaction of the second step, denoted by this slow amount, slow value of the rate, which is 2 liter per second. And the third step of the reaction could be able to produce quite an high amount of reactant, of pro product of reaction. But when a stationary state is attained, it will be able to produce product of reaction only the reactant that receive from the step two. This is the reason why that we can conclude that when we have a mechanism of reaction, namely a reaction, it is not fulfilled, it is not accomplished in only one step of reaction, we have that the slowest step of the reaction will affect the step of the whole process and the kinetic law of this reaction will be the same kinetic law of the slowest step. Okay? Well, at this point the lesson is over. In next lesson, we will be facing with another problem, which is the chemical equilibrium. Okay? See you in the next lesson.